just gonna have to grind it. What the heck? That's nasty. It is the final literal week. This is Monday, it's 1 p.m. We have to have this car ready by Friday evening because they pick it up Saturday. All the stuff we've been doing is restoring an old chassis. It has been nothing to do with the 6.2 liter red eye. It is going to be one mad dash to the end. Wish us luck and just enjoy the absolute shit show that will occur. We have been grinding all day and I'm not gonna lie to you, the chassis stuff is kind of a pain in the ass because you only get to do it once before you cover it up. And so you gotta do it the right way. And so it's just a bunch of grinding, welding, grinding, welding. And it sucks because next thing you know, it's nine o'clock at night. Well, everything is grinded down, everything's welded in. I'm gonna go ahead and primer the bottom side of this trans tunnel and then I'm gonna primer the top side of the trans tunnel where I cover it and I can't weld it. And then we're gonna go ahead and weld it, pull it outside and we'll be able to primer it all and paint it all and we'll be able to sleep good tonight, hopefully. This was a pain in the ass. I've got this fat knot here that I'm not happy with because I had to crimp all the grounds and everything to those six gauge. It's overkill for passing it to the back. So voltage will not be an issue. You can see that this won't go any further. I'm gonna have to use more tape and then glue it on there. But Joel doesn't give a shit about any of that. All he wants me to do is recover the length of this. We are all just busting ass right now. And the guys can't do anything but do like Concord level restoration. They're holding themselves to higher quality. It looks pretty damn good for what we're up against time-wise. Isaiah's gonna spray the weldable paint. done is I have all three fans with house air filters on them and they're all down drafting and I can't smell it and I, I'm being honest like yeah I can't either yeah like when he did it before we did this he had the fans blowing at it and the whole shop was just great but right now it's actually really impressive it's pulling it down and out those filters are badass yeah those are those are nice house HEPA filters um, we're gonna have to replace them soon though they're doing their job that said so am I this is the harness up to this point. This is what it's got to connect to. And this is also what it's got to connect to. There's all the power for the fuel system, the lights, the master kill switch. Very overkill using six gauge through here, but that's what they provided. So I ended up using that, splicing it into both the pumps and then all of the rear lights, which will all be LED anyway. This works really well. It sits up and in, and it goes along the floorboards over the wheel hump, and then splits out from there. So I'm really happy with that. With everything all welded in on the inside, it's finally time to spray paint. We're gonna set it down on the rear wheels and the front not wheels. This is insane. We have a whole beach. We can now like claim new land because of the amount of sand that is coming out of this vehicle. Nice little IPA wipe. Water. <laughs> oh God. Right. Oh shit, this is strong. Obviously we're not using a gun, so we're clearly not professionals, but 
at least the very idea is that we just wiped it down with alcohol. We'll hit it with the self-etching primer to really lock in a base layer. Kobe. <laughs> Joel yeah. thinks he's Picasso. I am. And so we're gonna watch him fuck it all up. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. What the fuck is that? Spray the paint. It is. Nothing is coming out. You don't see it? Let me right, show so you how it's really done. We're a professional this over is a here. professional. Oh wow. Perfection. Yeah, see? He was not doing this at all. Oh, that sprays on there nice. Move over SOS Customs. We're starting our own paint business. <laughs> it was a fun night out with the guys and we have a well-protected car. We haven't done the bottom side of the car, but the engine bay is all done. Passenger compartment's all done. And it's less of an eyesore. Let it dry off for a little bit and then move it back in. See what it looks like in the morning. And... Yeah, we're gonna walk out and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Just, yeah, uh, 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 that's, that's not fair. I ran out of it was paint. ripping on me just a second ago. Oh, and then, uh, twinkles. Look at that beautiful twinkle. <laughs> the third leg was in the way of that angle. So. <laughs> My side looks basically perfect. <laughs> Can't reach that. You couldn't reach right there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that spot. <laughs> if you thought this was a wild tire, you're right. This is where things heat up considerably. This is Mickey Thompson's ET drag tire. Now, what's really impressive about this one in particular, if you look up this product number, it doesn't exist yet. This is a tire that is not out for the market yet, and it is badass. This is actually meant for exactly the type of racing that I like, not fully prepped surfaces. It's the ET Drag, and it is a 28 inch tall tire. When you have a taller tire, the contact patch that occurs is longer. Way more science into this, but it's kind of like a wide tire would be turning your foot like this. It braces yourself against lateral motion, and then a tall tire helps kind of give you forward grip. Now that's not 100% true, but a quick, simple way of like kind of relating to that. Now these are nasty and they are bias ply, so there are no radials, steel or otherwise, in this tire. That's why we have this tire for Erica. The Pro Bracket radial tire. Now you can already tell the construction is still extremely insanely soft, but there are things radially supporting it. The way you launch off of these tires is very different than the way you launch off of these. When you have a radial on both the front and rear, the car sways and hits bumps the same and it's a much more controllable car. So I don't want to put my girlfriend into a thousand horsepower car that I built that's not even close to polished and have a mix match of tires because anybody who's ever driven something this soft knows that if you have this with a radial in the front, the rear sways and the front doesn't. I think the solid rear axle is going to help kind of calm that down a little bit. That said, I'm willing to ride this through and see what the hell happens with this. You really have to dial that launch in because if it goes too far down, this is all on the ground. When you press oh. it down hard enough, it pops back up. The goal is to watch this in super slow motion and there's a guy named Kevin online that has a lot of videos on how to do all this sort of science. These tires are insane and I cannot wait to try to pull a wheelie on this car. Maybe we do the suspension right enough that it doesn't pull a wheelie. Either way, this is gonna be the hardest launching car we have because it's the most low level torque, highest sticky tire ever. I cannot wait to show you guys more about this tire in particular because this is actually gonna get unveiled at the event we're going to. This is gonna make me wanna do something crazy with the four rotor. I can tell you that already. This is absolutely a big nightmare. The steering column is basically welded to the stud. And I tried using a really weird format to try and get it. It didn't sit on top of the nut, it sat on the side and then just rounded off the thread. So now my threads were gone. I'm in an even worse spot than I started with and I can't get this part off. I'm sweating bullets for multiple reasons and Will would 
sent me this white shirt, it's gonna be gone by the end of the day, I promise you that. I need to unpin certain wires so nothing shorts out and just to make sure they all go to everything and that all the connectors are clean because this can shut off the car. Either way, I can't stop now. I have to finish what I started. There's a custom bolt set up to pull this. We'll see what we can do. I got it off and everything else is fine. Now looking in here, you can see the reason for me doing all this. All the contacts are dirty. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this assembly out, clean off the contacts, deep pin things that I just will never need again. Less is more. I don't want all those wires coming out of there and then have something short. And on top of all of that, this whole assembly is super like janky. Yeah, so again, we need to be able to trust this. It looks like we can take this layer off and then take this piece off, clean it up quick, and spray paint these as well. Just one really small thing I want to show you guys is how the horn works because that is really incredible for the technology at the time. It simply presses down on this. This makes metal on metal contact from this plate to the wheel. This column goes to this wire and I thought I ripped the wire out when we did this. This wire is now shorter between these two, which means technically the wire and this short together when you press the horn. There's where the wire goes to is this ring. When you spin the steering wheel, that ring is sitting on this little roller ball right here. You essentially are shorting this to this when you press the horn, but no this way. springs down, it holds solid against the steering wheel. So when you press the uh, horn, you're shorting this to the body, but it can sick. let you rotate the steering wheel, you no know, wires or anything else involved. So I have the whole key assembly here. Now this is the half that actuates. I have cleaned it up while Joel was inside editing. The spring in there is what you feel when you go to start it. The grease inside of this was really, really gone. So one, two, so much cleaner. The connections just feel more deliberate. It's and more so satisfying. Much more satisfying, yeah, because it was like washy. We are finally at the phase of putting new stuff into the car. This is a very big moment, and we're starting with one of the best parts. That's Aeromotive's 15-gallon fuel cell. This is a package thing that they sell. It has the five-gallon brushless pump and the controller that goes with it, as well as a level sensor. We are going to use this potentially, oh, but it, it's baffled in here. I told them I, I didn't want to have oh, nice. a surge tank too, and they're like, you don't oh, need one. Shit. They offer both a vertical outlet and a horizontal. I said, hey, horizontal. And then here's the return line right here. We have a massive fuel filter, and then send 10 a.n., half inch roughly, and 8 a.n. back, which is like 3 8 or a little bit more. We're gonna do hard lines all the way down the car along our new chassis members. Mounting this is gonna be kind of a pain in the ass. The actual trunk is not level. We have a little bit of an issue, the tank's too low. The problem really isn't so much the bottom as much as it's the top. Those fittings need space. That's just not gonna work. I refuse to have fumes of any sort in the passenger compartment, so I don't want to raise it as is, drill holes through these and have it go through the, that, that's bad too. This is just too low. Like you're, you're looking at it with the diff at maximum extension. A lot of you guys mentioned in the comments, we did the frame rails wrong. We were actually supposed to shorten them. Didn't know that. Those are already low and then this, it's even lower than it should and it's at the very end of the car not in the center so as you're going up and down driveways and shit like that you're gonna hit your gas tank that's that's not a good move did you see over the bumper right now so we'd say an inch and a half out of four out of okay. four and a quarter i could mount it like this and i could cut this off and it'll be good. now we're down to like 10 gallons yeah we have Thankfully, a lot of companies helping us with this last second. Now, this wouldn't be such a stressful moment, but we have three days left. We have the tank from Holly and we have the tank from Aeromotive. This we're using, this I love. We don't even need a tank, I just want this. Our problem is it looks like it shit its pants. We just don't want to modify the trunk and we don't want fumes inside the car. It puts us in this awkward position. Isaiah came up with the wild idea, but plausible one, transplanting all of that setup, which is 10 inches, just like me. Nice. And, uh, Oh, shit. Damn, nine inches. I could take an inch off of that. Good. I agree with you. I think that's less than alternative. It, it's the same amount of work, but it's to this tank or that tank. Was this easier than just putting the surge in? Yeah, because we need a pickup pump to put into here anyways to feed yeah, the surge. Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're fucked either way. Save time on making the mount, and you'd save time on making the yep. inlet. And look OEM, this is a wash because it supports them both. You'd have to modify this, modify this. The most important thing, I guess, is to see how close this is to our diff nut. All that will fit in there, fine. 
So we'll have to use that space, that like negative space up there as where the hoses go. Because the diff right now could travel up into that area. And it's just night and day difference. I love the squareness of like a fuel cell, but it was too too low. It was too low. So OEM OEM tank, absolutely insane the, monster the fuel pump inside of it. It's gonna look stock, and it's gonna be the farthest thing from stock. Show you guys exactly what I'm gonna do. Cause cutting the circle of that weight, the fuel pump could actually drop in, and so I want to get rid of all that thread right there. And I know the body of the pump is three and a half inches, which I have a three and a half inch hole saw. But since there's a big hole in the middle, how the hell do you cut that out? So this is the max I could go with it being flat. So this is where the circle has to be. It just has to be right here. This is just a really hard piece to cut properly. You want to cut it right the first time. You don't want to fuck it up. You only have one chance. Since I don't need these threads anyways, I drilled this hole. Got these self-tapper screws from the whatever fuel cell that we had. I'm going to drill this into there, drill this into there, and then do my pilot hole so that way I could hole saw this all out and it could have a nice clean cut. If I would have sat here and dremeled this out, ported this out, whatever, it would have made a big mess. It would have took forever. The tank would have been even more disgusting. So just something quick to get on to the next step, especially when we're in time crunches like this, when the car the leaving this weekend and uh, we haven't even thought about starting it up. On bigger hole saws like this, I always like to do my pilot holes first so that we don't have the hole saw doing all this and you might catch it. So let the hole saw do the work. Don't give a lot of pressure. That's how you fuck a, a hole saw up a lot. The pump is in there. All the holes are drilled out. Everything is fine so far. We're gonna weld this guy straight onto here. So instead of putting a tube to go in there and get right into the bucket area, it's gonna hit this and kind of diffuse it straight down into the baffle. That's gonna be out and return. We are getting close to installing this back in the car. We have a little block off plate that's gonna go here. The steering rack is gonna hit the oil filters. Once the steering rack is in there, we need to get through this area to get to the steering column that provides the challenge with the stock headers. And we're gonna take this header off and that way we can be working on the steering column. It's assembly lube, just caught up in the spot where the oil cooler will be. That's why you change your oil after running it initially for a little bit. We're gonna try and get this whole assembly rotated. There's a hex drive inside of the very center of the oil thing, and so we're gonna see if we can get in there, rotate it, and lock it back into place. That's my dream. Otherwise, we're gonna have to move the engine forward. Whoa. I was not expecting that. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that at all. That's a lot. Yeah, it caught up. They don't need to run a cooler to, to test fire a motor. That's kind of sick. Just test the alternator, make sure that doesn't get in our way at all. Not even close. So if we have it like that, that's excellent. We're starting to put all these accessories in place so we don't forget about them when we go to make decisions. This will make planning way less difficult because we'll be able to see it all. This is actually a kit from a, a company back in Michigan that does non-variable speed AC clutch. This one just has like an on-off, like the old school parts want. But we can mount the steering rack now and get another idea of spacing. They designed this kit exactly for this setup. That oil pan and everything is all exactly meant to work together. The camera pointed directly at its lazy eye. <laughs> can you still see it? No. Yeah, that shows you why the Petronics ones. The Doug's headers uh, hopefully can outdo this because they're these are great, but just in the way. It is officially time for this engine to go in to its home for the first and last final time. It's a lot of work has come to get to this point, and this is literally the very beginning of the actual build with the crate motor. It's so, really good down here, right yeah, now. it does. It, yeah, that tunnel just turned out incredible. We're gonna go ahead and lower the car down carefully, like we did last time, but now with a little bit more extra on there. More? More? All right, that's good. That's the moment in 
my god, does it look good. It's less confusing color engine bay. Now we just gotta get the clutch to fit. The shifter is exactly 29 inches away from the bell housing front face. That puts us right at the back side of this brace here. I think that they have this option for like shorter transmissions. It's already notched out. And no, we didn't have it backwards. It flares out. We'll have to cut a hole there before we put the transmission on. But for now, we can put the clutch on, finally. I'm gonna show you how to deconstruct a sex sandwich. Ooh. And I'm not just taking this apart because I want to. I can't install a clutch without this attaching to the back of the motor. The pilot bearing race that's made out of aluminum is stuck inside of the engine and we don't have a little baby plier to get it out and we don't have a slide hammer. We don't have a lot of bullshit right now. It's, I'm honestly absolutely frustrated. What we are going to do is pack it full of grease. This is almost the exact diameter. So I'm gonna go ahead and pack it full of grease and then hit it and see if the hydraulic action of the grease will push the pilot bearing out. clutch in, but we have this pilot bearing to install and the existing one is in the way. And of course, it's too late to get a puller and all that sort of shit. I tried grease and grease did an amazing job, but the problem is I had so much air in there that it would bounce. I couldn't get that like hydraulic shock to the system. It was doing, doing, doing. We're like, shit, we can't get bread. They were thinking, jack in the box. And so I don't know if we're gonna use just the bread Maybe even the meat and the potatoes. Definitely not the cheese. It's a very deep hole. <laughs> we need the bread, dude. <laughs> I have faith in you. Let's see if we can get this race out of that spot. I'm gonna have to accept defeat on this one. I really tried buttering the car up. I don't know what sort of beef the car has with me but it sure buttered my bun. I don't know. <laughs> We're losing our minds. What is this? This is barely food. <laughs> We're gonna admit defeat right now and get a bearing puller, shave it down so it grabs the inner part and yanks it out with a slide hammer. This does not taste good at all and this is exactly the sort of meal a, a person who's defeated should eat. When I saw these being dropped off, I was like, I am such a traitor. It was $2,000 ship and it was, terrifying if it was gonna make it in time. One of the biggest cheats to this whole build, the Red Eye has a whole front cooling stack that you can buy. You can just buy it, it's a part number from Dodge. Oh, it's bent. Is it bent? Yeah. Oh, look. fuck, come on. Can I fucking catch a break here? It might actually still work. Yeah. Yeah. I paid a lot of money to have this overnighted. It's actually for the intercooler. The whole point before I was derailed by this, we can buy all the stock hoses for the red eye and get this thing plugged in so we don't have to make custom AN lines yet. Of course, we're gonna make this thing look beautiful when we're all done, all aluminum, everything, but this is that shortcut that's cheating. We're basically putting an OEM car into an old car. So hopefully this isn't as damaged. This gets us all the pulleys for the front of the motor without guesswork again. But there is the OEM power steering pulley. So just stuff that oh. you nickel and dime yourself with. It's all in there, bolted in. I got the little vacuum vortex thing shortened so that way this thing is literally right here at the bottom. At least to cap this guy off and we could go ahead and put her in. You guys can't see because it's super, super tight in there, but barely fit my finger between the top fitting and the chassis. And so this is all in, so it fits in there like a glove. Well, I've got the $170 piece of truth. Oh my God. Right here, yeah. Hooks into the back chamfer and then it's got a built-in slide hammer. We gently tightened this so it puts some pressure on these arms, but not enough to bend them. And so... Mm -hmm. 
I don't ever, ever want to get a metal shard in my face. We're just gonna have to grind it. I've tried heat, I've tried everything. No metal in my eyes. Uh, <laughs> get the fuck away there from me. There is no way you need. I'm pouring <laughs> A very major weakness of my current costume is that I can't see above me as so I just crack my neck on that rear tire trying to get back over there. That part's not advisable, but I cut equal and opposite sides and grind and grind and grind. By all means, I've done this enough times. Literally, this exact process, this is the worst one by far. This amount of damage I did to it. Thankfully, that, that doesn't transmit power or anything. This is literally just a pilot bearing for the tip of the transmission to spin inside of when the clutch is open. Disappointed that I had to come to this. I am covered in metal. I'm gonna need a magnet and duct tape, and at least it's not in my eyes at all. I had some McDonald's just to kind of take the edge off. <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> I've definitely caused some brain damage. It was a celebration of the fact that we got that piece off. We are going to trim these drip rail looking things back about this far and then just kind of angle them. Transmission bell housing hits here no matter what. And we're going to drop this whole assembly back, undoing the mounts to the chassis. Put the clutch on and then put the transmission. We have the double adjustables for the front in here. Compression and rebound are both wide open, but now we have the spring in place. So it's gonna fight me and start lifting up the front of the car. Uh, Ethan put the extensions on the steering rack so you can see the angle starts to bend out here, which I had to measure the distance between this joint and the other joint, and then measure the same for the lower control arm joint. Other one, same length. So that's really good. And then the same thing down here, bump steer is going to be massively, massively reduced. And you can see it's almost on the same angle. This is a pretty solid setup right now. We have definitely finally, absolutely confirmed that we're going to be cutting a hole right here. I got in the car and it's gonna be a three and a half inch diameter hole. With Ethan here, both Isaiah and I have been noticing how much we don't get to do the cool moments because we're on the hard part. I look over and Isaiah had to take one for himself and that was, Mounting the transmission for the first time without anybody else. And so, uh, that was the first time? Yeah. You can see the, the top of the transmission is square, flush with the channel, and even the casting right here is vertical. But you can actually see, clear as day, the mount is on the angle. That's actually natural. It's part of the casting. That threw me off for years. I don't even know if the metal mount that goes under there accounts for that, because it's meant for a couple different things. Looks like if you go to like Roseville, Moparts, same thing. This here in front of the mount. So the mount sits further back than what our kit thinks would happen. Isaiah knows that he can adjust, modify, adapt, overcome. That's enough for me to feel good about cutting the trans tunnel holes and then getting the trans mounted in this spot. We really haven't gotten to just pull this moment in and it looks really good with the engine sitting here. What we're gonna do is loosen up the engine mounts so when the transmission's in, it all kind of settles where we want it in and we lock it in its final place. I'm gonna work on the front stack, the alternator, the pulleys and all that, just to, again, fitment before anybody else is making other decisions, running hoses and whatnot. How to make 800 horsepower, plug it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <Wow. laughs> this pulley goes between this race right there. That's wild. If you don't want to have power steering on here, this is a pulley if you don't have this. Nice. Oh, yeah. That's pretty slick. So the kit gives you the choice. Like, by default, they actually have something in place. You don't have to run their power steering. That's really compact. It's like 600, 700 bucks to get this kit. I would rather have it. Oh, that alternator looks OEM, but that is the DC power monster right there. So those guys made that happen. Can you go more? That's all I got. I just realized the error of my ways. I have AC, which I never have. It's a separate kit. Let's, see right, let's pull it out and see if it's bigger, right? Oh my God. Okay, good. Okay, it's a little okay. bit. So here we go. Now we make love to the AC unit. Go over to the power steering. This hooks down 
here. This will go over the water pump down to there and then. Okay. Okay. Woo! That is the most complete front of an engine we've ever had in the shop. AC routing, power steering routing, power routing, all of those things can now be visualized and not shortcutted. I took a little hour nap. Thankfully I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> By that time Ethan got the steering rack stuff done and the U-joints are all like in alignment so it's not lub dubbing there and it's just enough slack in here to be able to remove it. You did it exactly how I did on the four rotor where it was like only if you did it exactly right and pulled every piece were you able to get two to separate. He got all that done. Joel and I are going to walk over to the gas station. Then we're going to go ahead and put the clutch out. So there is the final result of that entire surface other than the two spots where I grind and went through the thing are smooth. And the back surface is a little galled up just from hitting things against the bearing puller with the little teeth pulling it and it rubbing. It's really actually in excellent shape. We're going to go ahead and put the bearing. Thank God it fits. Now I'm gonna get a block of aluminum that will hit on this outer race to prevent me from pushing it in the wrong way. Flat. You have the choice between blue Loctite and red Loctite, and that really tells you a lot about yourself. So, how confident are you? I'm not. We're with blue. These are gonna crank down to about 75 foot pounds. And they are like those nice sexual bolts. This is a lot of flywheels. I've been saying you're gonna do this I've for like two this. weeks. This is directional. Uh, the angle I had, it didn't have all of them go into the, the right spots. That's weird. Yeah, that's a very new one for me. Jack's clutch's uh, instructions do say to, to do a two-layer torque, kind of like we do with the motor. I'm not gonna call it what its proper name is, but we're gonna use this metallic phallic object to guide us in our spiritual journey. So there, and we'll just keep loading everything in this way. The plates between this line with all these, Transmission side, this is a middle clutch towards us. Okay. You'll start seeing these fingers coming down. You have to make sure that this whole assembly can make this easy to, to pop in and out while it's being tightened. Not halfway through it's being tightened, but before and after. There we go, so let's see. We did it. God, I love their clutches. The hole is, starts right in the very center of all this. <laughs> oh, nice. Hell yeah. Sometimes having the right technique, sometimes having the right tools makes all the difference. I've hole sold things from home with trash and it looks like trash, trash in, trash out. But it's just nice learning techniques, seeing what the internet has to offer, learning from other people. I have not final mounted the hydraulic bearing. Now I can measure the clutch fingers from the face, from this face with that spacer and just make sure that there's the correct five millimeter or whatever space. I'm gonna do that right now and then this damn thing goes in. I think we're ready to put it in we are loosening the subframe, all four bolts, so that way we don't put pressure on the front bolts and see if that gives us enough angle to pop it up. We're gonna go ahead and lower it from here. Starting to. We can bring it up until this starts to touch and then tilt the front up a little bit more and then try to, okay. I got like a whole inch of hitting. Yeah. We need that whole engine to come down way more. The input shaft is hitting the side of the clutch. It's almost easier to take this off of this, take this whole assembly down. I say I came up with the best the best solutions right now, honestly. Powerful frame, they draw like a cable jack. Can handle a thousand pounds. If it's flat, stable, we put some maybe some wood if we really want to clear these, but we have stability all the way from the front to the engine. And so we're gonna lower the whole car onto that. Obviously, we have to do that. Give it a little air. Oh, yep. rotate it. Uh, I'm going to rotate it. 
rotate it right there. Go ahead and oh, go ahead and lock those in. I know we're gonna pull it. I could do this all day. Shit. Can you is do it while getting tickled? <laughs> I had like a brief moment of panic. I'm like, no, I could not handle a tickle. I definitely think it's time for Joel to get a couple shots with this thing. This is the last time it's gonna be this clean and this together. And in fact, this almost should be a thumbnail. We could all stare at this shot forever. It's got a cool motorsports feel to this. It's not for looks, it's for functionality. So we're gonna go ahead and get it right back in with our transmission. The stack is done. You can really tell how important the transmission mount is because all of this is being held to the car by four bolts. Okay, that's good. With the major part of the car, the elephant, almost elephant, in the room, I thought would make it easier for me. It has made it far more insane solely because we have essentially one business day and then Monday. So if we need something, we maybe get it by Monday and we don't even know if the car will work. So that's got me a little overwhelmed. With this project, we are using mostly OEM parts, but then that little bit ends up making it where you can't use any of them. Just tons of custom on top of tons of OEM. Even if this was in the right spot and everything like that, I still don't think it would have fit because the T56s have this slotted mount. That's all bolted in, that's all bolted in. I had to trim it down because the transmission's pulled back. I have this plate, the bolt into here, it touches both sides and it's at this weird angle. So I got this little thing to reinforce it in the back side. It's cut out so I'm gonna hit the transmission on the inside, tack her in, and then I'll take her over to the table. And Jim Reel is a very near and dear friend of mine and his company, J.E. Reel, made the four-rotor drivetrain possible. He's local out here in like Pomona. And so he sent one of his guys over. Drive shafts are actually take a little bit of work to make. And he's just like the 11th hour, 11.59 and 59 seconds. They got the right front spline. It's a pretty standard setup, but not in a very standard car. Sure, you can tomorrow afternoon. Thank you so much. You got it, thank you. Here's one of our most critical challenges. Steering rack is new, right? It's a totally different steering rack. The headers are right in the middle of that. We knew that. We do have the backup option of using Holly's log ones. Those will work. It's gonna be like a cost analysis sort of thing. We have so many things that Ethan, Isaiah, and I could do is modifying these the right move. The benefit is that these will be the highest horsepower ones by far. The question is, can you move it within an hour? Can you move it within two hours? What else could you be doing with that time? It's nice to see them, but we now can make better decisions as we're working on other systems and kind of keep juggling as we go. It's kind of where it's supposed to be, but not really. So the best thing that we could say to do would to try to be bring this all the way over this way. Actually, no, it does I don't mind. That was a thought, but just kidding. Oh. I guess instead of the opposite of, oh. <laughs> It's completely out of the way. 
Uh, that's why you keep your options open. Yeah. If there is ever any way a car guy can show his partner true love, it's by using pure copper, beautiful, 2 aught gauge wire. This is the pinnacle of battery wire to me. This is actually welding wire, and my buddy James had dropped this off as a gift years ago, and I've saved it for a very special project. Very finely stranded, so you're gonna get minimal voltage loss. The reason that you do stuff like this is that if you put trash in at this level, you're gonna get trash out when you're going to push the car for more power. This is not 2,000 horsepower harness. That's probably four gauge wires. I don't want that loss of voltage going to my fuel system, going to anything else. This is all just no questions asked type of tuning. You'll see less and less of the stock harness as we learn more and more about what it needs to do. So we have a really nice one aught zero gauge wire running from the alternator to the starter. At 270 amps, a total of maybe 3% battery loss. So if the alternator is producing 14.4 volts, it won't see 14.4 and everything else, it'll see 13.9. And the wire will stay a nice 122 degrees at max. This is the moment that I watch the video and start crying because it's irreversible. I'm gonna gut and cut into the Dodge harness. So we'll just do it with less talk, more action and it's over. I'm not gonna hype it up like it's the end of the world. This goes to the stock supercharger pump, which we'll be using the Pureberg water pump anyway, and these are just the control lines. This harness will get even easier to manage if all the power wires are out of it. Our goal right now is to start placing things into the car and have it easier for Isaiah to see what the fuel system needs to do. So we're putting things in where we know they roughly go, instead of just staring at it and trying to guess and then you're forgetting one line here and then the brake line now can't be ran. It's a lot easier to critique when it's set in there than it is to kind of try to invent it from scratch. Pedals can be cut, bent, welded, doesn't matter. So the box can go where it was supposed to go. It can go over here and the rest can just kind of start falling into place. This is the fuel line in right here. Quick disconnect and then there's the fuel pressure sensor there. We are going to just deadhead this right now. So this is just gonna go straight to the fuel pressure regulator and then so will the feed line. That's our current plan of attack to be able to start this. The fuel pressure regulator can probably go down under there. We've got the heater core lines with a heater core stop valve. Well, this is so you, your passenger compartment doesn't get hot while there's coolant cycling through it. This pauses that. We have to run that no matter how frivolous that is because the whole coolant overflow tank that's sitting way over there runs two lines and they tee off to both of the heater core lines. They don't go to the radiator. The radiator just simply in and out. It's the heater core where you bleed the system. The two AC lines will also come around in this area. And then also this two supercharger lines. So we have two, two, and two. So these two will go back this way. These two will come up this way, go to the tank, and then go to the intercooler radiator and then all the way over there to the intercooler pump and intercooler second radiator. A lot of pairs of things going on here. And then on the final set of things that we have to juggle is the, all the power steering stuff. My stock damage stack, these little quick disconnect fittings, that's actually for the power steering. All of those things require driver's interface. They're all part of your experience in the car, the shifter's position, all of that sort of stuff. We can finally put the seat in, just set it on the four bolts, hopefully it still lines up. And let's see what it feels like sitting in the car. too far forward. Yeah. Look at that. Not even, not even fucking close. Nonetheless, first experience of what it might be driving it. This is my front brake line lock. This is gonna go up near the brake wheel. This is gonna end up somewhere and connect into the front brake. So it holds the pressure of the front. When you let off the pedal, the rears open back up. Whether we get it functional or not, I've been wanting one of these for a long time. I've got a, lo a lot of variety of lower level ones. This is a fully dynamically adjustable flow control valve for the clutch. It'll feather the clutch the exact amount, and this is the premium version of it, where it's meant more for the hydraulic bearings, not just the traditional throwout bearing. Tons of control about that. What this is, it looks like the line lock piece, right? But what it does is that when you go to launch it, it has to go through here. But as soon as you're done launching the car, 
and you're in a manual transmission like this, have it just bypass the valve. So on my three rotor, on my four rotor, on all the other cars, on even the rotary vet, we have it where it's a flow control valve that is like a check valve. It goes out easy, and then as it comes back, it slows down. So for your launch, perfect. First to second, yeah, now your clutch isn't engaging as fast because you're doing the same exact flow control valve every shift. It allows you to short circuit the system and it goes back to being a traditional clutch, meaning that you have that fast clutch engagement. This is perfect for a T56 Magnum like this because you're clutching every gear no matter what. Just gotta get things figured out. So we're using the Optima that the car came with. This is the rear harness plugging into the power ground and the rear data. So now that one is designed to go through this hole right here and it'll run along this and then hide in this area right here as well. So all three of these will hide in this corner. So here's the fuel pump controller and that'll go in that little valley there. This is fuel level and variable fuel pump. And this is all the power and grounds for the rear lights and master cutoff switches. I've already drilled holes before things really got crazy. This is how far I felt comfortable getting before I realized this would be somewhere in this area. Just put that one there and then... Very OE of you. Thank you, thank you. It feels so good for me to be able to finally like work on the car. I've been doing planning this entire time and watching Ethan get to do all the fun stuff. These, I actually bought the Deutsch connector hangers. So this, oh, no yeah, I purposely made these all the female sides so that way this thing could be clipped in. I got the majority of the power out of this. We'll take the close to connectors, coils eight and so on, and see where that forces us to put the stock ECU. Because I hate the idea it's gonna be an engine bay. These are a bitch to get off because they're safety locks. Those will go down to the starter. Well, that'll end up having to go tucked down behind the motor. There's like a 2% chance that I can push this through. That's the ECU. We're still stuck with this side. I'm gonna work on getting rid of this wonderful piece, but I wired the whole car for this already. This is another harness that I wanna get almost completely rid of. This I want. This is the reason I went with this company is they had the rally dash replacement. This unit goes all the way over there and that would connect into their ECU. This is the shit I didn't want. I never wanna see another relay in my life. That gets rid of all of this. Putting this front stack on the car because I need to figure out where the wiring harness goes for all of this. It looks actually pretty promising. Wow. Okay. We got a bit of a problem. That hits there. This hits here. And if it goes out any further out, now that hose is on the outside of the car. Oh no, 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 no. Fuck UPS, guys. Come on. The whole assembly has to go back now. This absolutely fucks us hardcore. A couple major things come out of this. We can't use this fan. We can't use the radiator because the radiator is cracked, which means we can't use the stock hoses, which is the whole reason I bought the radiator. So we have to go back to the customer, which is great. It's obviously higher quality than this radiator. We can't use the AC unit because obviously it's in the middle of the stack. So we could get an AC unit. All the plans I had for getting all the custom hoses and everything just completely changed. Cool. Thanks, UPS. Nice solid radiator. Isaiah doesn't need anything else on his plate. He's already completely loaded all the way to Monday. I'll deal with this. So now this changes a lot of the hoses that we need to get. Transmission cooler down there can be the power steering cooler. Now the AC system it doesn't exist. We don't have an intercooler system. We took an L, but it's a trade-off, you know. If somebody is hurting, somebody else has to be doing great so yeah. we have not used these big ass oh. quick connects yet and so since everything literally drops in with the subframe i didn't want to like cut out a channel and replate it and that's just not the way i like to do it well, we have this existing hole and uh, we have this big ass tan line right this literally is almost oh. it's almost oh. like I, I could grind it down and, and be yeah. in there. No matter what, on hard lines, you're always going to be a female because they can't do a male inside this flare. That's just that's not how hard lines are made. So if this is male and this is female, I'm going to have a union female over here and male over here. So it 45s down. And so this is going to be somewhere like this. This is going to bend up a little bit. 
and it's going to be nice. Yeah, they're, they're going to be married. And so this is going to be a hard line to kind of like a bulkhead type thing over here. This is what they call a bulkhead. It's just literally all the way through. And so I need one that's two and a half inches long to go all the way through here. And there's a nut on this side. So this way it, it's a part of the chassis. This is sturdy and rigid and it's not going anywhere. So these are gonna go through here. That way we'll be able to disconnect this guy and then the eight return, which will go like that. And then there's two lines that would hang loose and you could drop everything else well, along like with this, everything. Two pressure the engine. Yep, exactly, yep. Yeah. I do the same thing with the bulkhead for the brake line, because it needs to be one line that goes all the way to the back. So there'll be a three bulkhead right here. Then a little brake line comes in and it's gonna hard line up here and then hard line to the back. So this is gonna be like our control panel pretty much. Well that definitely does offset the bad stuff I've been dealing with. I've got a lot of custom solutions right now. My dream right now is to find the right size, two inches thick, and then I know eventually I can put a one inch thick AC condenser in front of that. It is time to unbox one of my favorite companies type of packages. I do not own a European vehicle, but my God, do I keep running into my guys at FCP. I probably do not keep them in business, but I certainly help their bottom line with the number of water pumps I buy from them. Pierberg that actually makes the pump for a BMW X5, X6 or so, and this was suggested to me years ago. It has been an amazing pump for getting a lot of water coolant moved. This is what Hellcat guys use to upgrade these cars. This will take the coolant from the supercharger and run it through the other sets of radiators. Hey guys, the you real or just incredible saving our ass as usual. That's nice. Yeah. That's a four inch diameter monster. There we go there. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Yeah, it's, it's in there perfect. That thing's light as hell. Is it? Yeah. Hey, hey. 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 We just got... Man, you guys have made no progress. Literally. <laughs> wow. Jim Reel just got us this rush order from last night. Oh my god. So, it's... It looks the like most, a car. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the, like, blessings of being where we're at is where we're right down the street from G&J. If you guys are in the IE area, SoCal, G&J has a bunch of fittings and they make our hard lines like this for us. So I bend up all these lines. They're gonna go to them like this and then they're gonna come back up. hard line. So these are all the brake lines for the rear of the car. I'll go pick up the line that I dropped off earlier and drop them off these lines. And then I got a whole list of, of fittings and stuff like that. So we will be back and hopefully we have hard lines. I started off with this welding rod. So now we have two fuel lines. I've driven this car maybe twice and I forget it's a Hellcat. So it just happens to have this nuts engine in it and it, it's like the most calm purring car ever. We're gonna distract my lovely girlfriend and steal a shit ton of parts out of this car. She is letting us look at it and it's answering some questions that we've had. Like you can only look at so many pictures, but you know, the angle of how this one thing runs. First thing comes to mind, this whole intake elbow that comes with the uh, aftermarket setup doesn't go this way. It's a really awesome K&N looking filter, but it collides with things. Another thing is these are the intercooler lines. You see it? They're hard lines. Yeah, they're half hard lines. This is the coolant overflow. That's the intercooler overflow. So where does this plug in? And you can actually see, see that hose on the top running to the back of the motor? It actually connects into the heater core side of things, not the radiator. I knew this after spending probably an hour researching it because nobody takes pictures of that. Because why would you? One of the most iconic things that Dodge just destroys everybody else at is the lights are just incredible. Yeah. So we're gonna try and match that energy with Holly's retro bright ones. They're beautiful. Just like Erica. <laughs> and uh, they bolt in. So Erica's gonna take the aluminum sandwich plate off of this. It's what aligns it and holds it to the car. And so three screws, and she'll clean off this ring and then sandwich it back onto the new headlights. This is the stock headlight. And this is high beams. So there's that. And then... Jeez. It's nice and clean. Looks way better too. Yeah. That's awesome. 
fraction of the current usage and just that crisp, modern cleanness with the OEM styles. These are worth every bit of the money. And this car, if nothing else, will present beautifully well from the headlights. We have one of the most amazing pieces for this car. For context, let me show you what the dash looks like on the car stock. This is the rally with the E at the end dash. This is a very sought after, higher quality item for the car. The stock dash actually looks pretty sick in my opinion, but this is the rally E dash. And this is a very expensive piece. I can monkey with this thing and actually get it to read a lot of the sensors. Look at this, so basic. A little capacitor, a little bit of magic, and you can try and figure out the range for these things. This is mechanical, so your speedometer is a gear driven off of the automatic transmission. I saw this while Googling how to modify that. Ooh. Yeah. Sick. All beautiful backlights, electronically actuated gauges, almost identical to the stock car. Very, very similar. That way, the purist in me doesn't damage this in any way. And we still get the OEM fitment and get like modern technology with it. The whole thing is capable of being backlit and it can be backlit any color, RGB, whatever color combo. The thing I'm gonna do for Erica is this will be backlit white at all times. When she presses one button, this thing goes to red. The car opens up the exhaust valves and the boost then steps up. The bypass valve closes down even harder so it raises the boost to full boost. So she basically has like a demon mode for the car. A good relationship requires one of you to be a pack rat and the other one to throw out all your shit. And that's what I'm expecting to experience right now. I don't have the strength to do this alone. I do. It's rotting. No, no, it's not. It has character. I just was in the middle of a dust storm. My apologies. But we're keeping the carpet, right? The carpet is worse. Okay, I do not have the strength. I can't. Basically, my muscles work for certain things that they don't take. You see all that time. junk over there? That's all him. Yeah. Take this outside and dust it off. No. All the way to the trash. Which one was usable? I feel like this one's more usable. I'm scared to breathe. What comes out of that? Yeah, I wouldn't. Um, Please, I'm not touching touch, it. Touch. If you don't touch it, it's going back in the car. <laughs> I doubt that. Touch it. No thanks. <laughs> Please? No. Yeah. Uh, okay. We'll just dust this off just to see what it looks like. You mean we'll just throw it at the dump? <laughs> yes. What do you mean? We don't need that. Well, we're gonna get, if say we buy a brand new one of these, we need to know, is it gonna fit with the new tunnel that we made? <laughs> Why do we need to know can't that? We just, can't <laughs> we just buy like a square of carpet? We like, can. And then custom cut it? We, we don't can. need that. You want to buy, you can buy. <laughs> the Joel and Erica plush fund. <laughs> there, that, that's motivation for me to throw it out. What? Well, the rust. That's been there the whole time. <laughs> it's been there for many years. As long as I've been alive. I've got in overnight from FedEx the AC system. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to end up like this. But easier to have something in place and go, okay, we're going to have to have lines here or there or somewhere. So the AC system is in. Holly's other radiator is actually really perfect for this. Wow. This thing's light. When I got the box, I was like, there's nothing in there. 
this stack is actually the final stack. I feel very confident about that. It doesn't cover a single bit of the core. It fits in between the rails perfectly. The only thing I would have a complaint about, and I knew getting into it what it would be, is that this is smaller than the rest of the stack, but it doesn't need to be bigger. I am very, very happy with the alternative. This is a two inch core. The intakes are a little bit wider, but the positive situation here is that this is even thinner than an inch and it can fit inside of this core here as well. So the stack will sit in the stock situation. This is beefier than the OEM intercooler stack. Not only can it hold more liquid, but it also just has more surface area with the thickness of the core. We'll be putting the fans through a little bit more work because you know, fatter stack, but everything's more efficient. We can modify and make everything custom scratch. We could cut this off and weld it at 20 a.m. We don't have time. So the question is, what do we focus our hardcore effort on? And so that's why we're trying to use the fact that most of this stuff does bolt in because that's the point of this project. So I feel pretty confident about that, but you might see some weird double clamps or hoses in the meantime, and that makes us die on the inside, but I'd rather have a double clamp car than no car. I have Ethan cutting the holes for the brake booster. So ignore the pedals, just the brake booster. Get it as high up in the engine bay as possible, mount that first, and then we'll deal with the pedals and the weirdness that comes with that. Instead of making it like, let's try and juggle everything, simplify. It doesn't fit because the brake booster is supposed to go here and then we have this whole length up here. It just will not physically fit in there. So, what I'm gonna do is cut the top of this piece right here so that this whole thing can go inside of it. It's gonna stick out on the outside, but we're gonna figure out how to make a box to cover it later on. Vintage Air, I have a love-hate relationship with them because right now their custom kit is actually kind of working, but I don't like it sitting all the way up here. Beggars can't be choosers. So the only issue I have is that this kit was actually made for the AC compressor to be on this side of the motor, and it's not, it's over there. One of the two hoses is just long enough to make it to this side and be crimped onto there and make all my dreams come true. The other one that comes from the cool air that's touching you and then comes down under here, you can see, that's not gonna work. I'm coming up a little short. The, the thing I could do is go on Summit or find somebody that makes basically these two fittings, an aluminum hard line, so, and it just has to be like a one foot extension, maybe even two foot, so to have that go all the way to like here, it'll be even cleaner, and they both can go down and then over to there. So I, I feel super confident that the AC system of all of our systems can actually be all connected together. I don't even need to charge it, I just don't want it open to the elements, at least for the guys right now, it shows them, hey, can't run X, Y, or Z through this area. It helps everybody make better decisions. It's finally time to change the dodge butt plug into two pieces. It's important to always make sure there's a base. So it doesn't get stuck. So it doesn't get stuck. I'm gonna cut right at this point, and this will be the thread going into the custom oil filter system. The reason I'm cutting the stock one up is there's a snowball's chance in hell I can actually use this combination with this other half and do a really wild setup, having an actual thermostat. If not, this piece comes with that and I can just screw the filter on. Either way, we need two of these, so I can't just use this one on the engine and I don't want those threads fucking up the engine either. I don't mind it messing up and galling up this aluminum $20 piece. So this steel piece gets cut now. No more talking. <music> Thread check, let's see if I can thread this in without much effort. Yeah, nice and smooth. We'll lock tight both sides. Okay, so we can finally install this thing, but we don't know which way it's gonna end up threading to. It's not bad. That's perfect. So these two lines now will 90 and then go either up through here or down here, but that, again, now you can see why the AC system is so important to have in just sitting there. Pressing for time, I cut this thing down and it turned out really good. It's just a little bit too long on the unthreaded area. It creates too much of a gap. 
for this piece. I'm gonna put this together and then we're just gonna go to the three hose method, which just leaves the cooler running all of the time. So it'll take a little bit longer to heat up the engine. We'll place the cooler and this out here and you won't ever see the oil system. I feel like we're fucked. I did none of this. Huh? Okay, I'll take credit. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I also did none of this. Ethan put this in, cut out this upper part so that way we could fit the pedals in here and they fit really well in the engine bay. The brake booster looks really nice. There's enough room for all the other stuff going on in it, but just doing some measurements and one of these need to go over about four inches and the four inches actually works out pretty well with the chassis because there's this little hump right here that if we put it in here, it's going to hit the hump and you're not going to have the travel you need. So if we go over about four or five inches max, and that'll give us enough room for the gas pedal. They weren't in there before and they're in there now, so that, that's fantastic. We need to talk about cutting this just enough to where we could bend this and keep the position because Rob was saying that this is some crazy um, ratio and we need to keep that for, you know, the brake master cylinder to have that right amount of pressure when you push on it because if not, it gets all weird and then you might as well be in the forwarder situation again. <laughs> and we'll be able to just bend this and keep the same ratio. This guy is going to be a little bit harder because the way this bend is, Rob could weld this up yeah, for us. Yeah, so, is... you know. I attacked that with no eyes. Does that feel weird? Yeah, it feels too close. Yeah, that, that already, because yeah, obviously my foot's not going to be down there. Yeah. <laughs> Pedals, they like they work for all those situations. <laughs> now, put yourself like if you're an air cut. <laughs> Dainty now. It feels right. Something where it's somewhere like that. We'll just do what Dodge said for that distance. Okay. That way it's just kind of OEM. excited and proud for this little spider wing monster thing. Let's show how it's supposed to be connected. So we'll tighten down like that. And just a little here, we can even have it kind of zip tied to this. That would then go like that. That way this thing's always being held and then this would actually go over and up through the bulkhead. So now we're ready to fully put this in. We got this nice wiring done and the OEM piece had like this foam stuff on top of it so Rob got this foam stuff and we're just gonna put this on top of this to kind of create a barrier between you know stop from metal on metal. Streetcar things? Yeah, yeah streetcars, exactly. Yeah. 
Even though we're at the, like, the last second possible for this event, we can't cut corners. The event will come and go. Just like what he's doing with this, I'm doing with the wiring, with the whole fuel system where we just don't think twice about it, don't second guess it, don't yeah, shortcut it. I got tasked with the amazing task of mounting the oil cooler and the oil filter. I only finished the fuel system. We have this lovely amount of space in this area. The thing that kind of sucks is that the bumper kind of has this like no chin type thing that yeah. kind of comes down right here. So that's the end of the bumper. And then the other metal bumper bolts on right here. So I can't bolt on to anything right here. So I need to save about two, two and a half inches of space. So that way this could slide in and out without having to take the oil cover out every single time. There is a lot of space inside this whole area though. But if, you know, thinking about airflow in the future and whatnot, we're gonna have to put a fan on here. Options are, I was way back here, but the tire might hit. Um, up here but you get no airflow this is a nice mounting area this is very flat if i can mount to that it's a part of the fender though so it's not the strongest i have this uh, amazing idea of angling the oil cooler and putting it back over here this way i could mount the oil filter right on top of that the third completed harness all pinned out and everything all the fuel system is all wired up so plugging this end into ground the pdm and then at fuel level Cars functional from there all the way back. Boom. Boom. The only one left is this one for the lights. So all this would hide under there. Maybe I've lost all sense of reality, but it is time to destroy one thing that is very obviously easily working. <laughs> I'm not going to think about it too much, but I've just severed the entire power to the Dodge harness. This is repetitive for the fuel pump control, for cooling fan control, turning on the car, ignition switch and all that. So what I'm gonna do is just make sure what goes to what, put the connectors on there and then tee them into my PDM. I have gutted the shit out of this harness. There's only three, like the unknowns, but things that might bite me in the ass or they're just pinned to the ECU and I don't wanna take them out. This plugs into the computer, ground, spare stuff, other harness and then over to my EDM. I am not going to put this in the engine bay. I'm going to bring the engine bay to us so we pass through only the engine harness and then all that shit gets connected. I don't care if the ECU sits on the floor for now, but I can keep it much easier controlled and much cleaner in the engine bay if it's all sitting right here. To get that to work, I'm gonna have to put these two in the interior, which is actually challenging because of how big they are. We have this plate here that I might back off so then these two go on the inside to connect to the computer and the other harness. This is just a ground, and then there you go. You've got a harness that'll look something like that in the engine bay. Yeah. I am using half inch DR25, which should shrink down to a quarter inch. This is almost three eighths. The numbers match out that it should recover and look really nice. But this Kevlar is meant to keep this super flexible, but also keep it all in line so it can bend and not have any problems. Yeah. Because that's going to be a nightmare, the trick to this is you get them all roughly where they want to be equal, not expanding. Tape this area. And then, my real trick, we do this. Oh, I know what you're about to do. Making that anchor. carrying much at all. That always amazes me. The only part that looks like the original harness is the part of finishing up now. That's the beauty of all this. Power, ground, all that shit, all done. And then this side, we'll hang it near the steering column and then just kind of cut some of these to length. If not, just leave them all the same length for now and deal with the fact that one row might be three inches too long. I've got probably another hour till I get this to a happy spot. And thankfully this side can be done as we go, like one's a door sensor. You don't have to have it running. I just disable those circuits and so nothing will short out and have problems at all.
we might just be able to pull this off thanks to m and who is also known as Weld or Forge Star, both companies I absolutely love that have made so many of my builds possible. This is the perfect wheel. Light, beadlock, the right offset. We have unreleased Mickey Thompson tires. We have Weld wheels, 15 inch beadlocks on the rear. I already know that they're gonna look insane for this car. Oh, oh my God. So even- better yeah this is a 15 by 10 with 45 millimeter offset these will work on the three rotor instead of it just being a one-off car and then you do some bullshit and you sell it on some sort of raffle like everybody else does this is for me these wheels those tires and mickey thompson everybody all these companies have been so helpful they're for multiple cars let's test it no, no. my bigger studs don't work once it goes onto the studs I did all the measurements that'll just barely miss this. The good news is I can fix this with the studs and all that sort of shit. It's just a last second kind of like twist. These are conical, so they have like a cone shape. That's meant for the traditional studs, which, which I can convert these back to the traditional studs. Just have to figure it out a little bit. This is not a problem. Let's unbox the fronts. This is the one that we have to get working ASAP when we kind of screw through the vent. In this Ooh. case, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You got a lip on this one. That's the funny thing about this car is because I'm using the RX-7 offset in the rear, you have more dish in the front. So it might take a little bit of fitment. If I haven't told you I'm losing my mind, absolutely. It's, it's been gone. No questions asked that when, when you don't mess with it. If you're looking for a formula, the front wheels are 17s, eight wide, zero offset from weld, these wheels work with the QA1 system. We have a really wild solution. Ethan's gonna love this. These are flat wheels, flat bottom, non-tapered, non-conical lug nuts. I have not been using them as such on the RX-7. You can see a little bit of a divot from the stock RX-7 lug nuts. And so I knew that they would work with this setup. This is flat and it's meant for that. So Weld sells you that with that intention. So the new wheels, on the other hand, are tapered. They have a conical shape and they are just barely too small for this. They are not designed for what we're doing. It fits the threads. It's these sleeves that you have to make it a little bit larger for, so 11 sixteenths. I have ordered 5 8 inch by 18 thread lugs, conical, so they will seal and center the wheel. So I'm gonna take a mill for both the very center one just to ream it out a little bit, and then this outer one, I'm gonna ream out just enough to be able to fit a socket in there. We got this after we got the three rotor all together, but these guys make drive-by-wire pedal adapters for the FDRX7. So I was laying in bed, going through all the project plans, I was like, wait a second, that's in my drawer of spare three rotor part. I put one bolt in and we can drill this other one. And really I was gonna just use it as a guide. Imagine this corner cut off and we mount this up even a little bit higher. You see that it almost puts us right where we need to be. It simplifies the job completely. So what I'm gonna have Ethan do right now is drill the second hole for this top plate. That way we don't get this wibbly wobbly. We'll cut off this corner to get the whole plate up even higher. Drill that hole, drill these holes in the firewall, put spacers, I don't give a shit, get the bottom plate mounted and then pivot. I think these guys saved our ass. the whole front harness and I'm impressed myself. I'm not impressed with myself, I'm impressed. This actually has all of the front harnesses in it. This is the part that will go from the firewall here, brake, booster shit, line lock shit going across there, flow control valve thing for the coolant, and then it goes all the way to the front and then breaks off to one master ground for all the power stuff, and then fans and lights, turn signals, three spare circuits, pulse width circuits, AC clutching. I'm going to sh start here, don't add any of this shit in, and then sheath that middle section, and then finish the rest of this, and then finish that. That way I can get this very center, real tight area nice, play with the rest of it as we go both ways. 
I'm waiting on the gas pedal, which is very quickly coming together. So that way I can finish this harness. Once the dash goes in, the steering column goes in, and then I can finish the core of turning things on, switches and so on. Life will be good. Absolutely nothing bad will happen now. It takes forever to melt and recover the thicker, bigger stuff for good reason, but also so that way we have more protection against the elements. Ethan and I are gonna go ahead and get the core of the dash in. Now I can actually run my harness and I know where it can go exactly. I push on the socket on the washer and it just like glass just shattered. The, the washer just disappeared. It just <laughs> into three pieces. That's made out of like pewter. <laughs> it's oxidized but not like rusted. It has me worried about the rest of the car. <laughs> All that's gonna be left when we're done down the drag strip at into the corn mile is gonna be the structure. The, the and two the, rails and our two rails, tunnel. Our tunnel, the engine, the subframe, all the QA1 stuff. The whole car is just going to be off it. I'm just going to be sitting there. <laughs> I got the front harness installed as I was hoping. It really made a difference where these connectors are and where it holds on to everything. You can see it's sitting on the steering column. And then now I can cut those all to length. I was estimating and thankfully this side turned out well. I am purposely working on the AC because it gets really confusing because it's right next to the core of this stuff. And then I'm gonna start pinning the ends of those while I have Ethan working on putting all the dash pieces we've never seen before. I wanna put the really nice dash in, but not yet. I'm purposely like buying time by not finishing the core core. And the reason why is that as soon as I turn the key on to test things, yes, it, it boosts morale, but it kind of deceives everybody in thinking that, oh, we're close to turning the car on. I do not want to give that impression because there's so many small things that are still left to do. Four in the morning last night rolled around and I was like, I need to order an intake filter for this car. We saw the stock car has it go straight out. That ended up being like way too long and they were like $700 and we have this. I just angled it, figured it out what I, I could see like emotionally in my heart and have it like this it should line up and clear the power steering and life be good and that's exactly what happened i did cut off the vent that recirks or whatever you call that EGR. that one's going to go in right here surprisingly this works really well and we keep the stock temp sensor 1205 first time the car is going to go on and I don't even mean the ECU, the, the engine. Very first time testing an electrical system on this car. It's literally to get the key working. I am going to go live with the battery. Ground on first. I saw a little baby spark, which it should be because it's powering. I hear it. The PDM should be live. It's responding. So none of the channels are on. I already have like the starter relay turning on, but the starter relay goes through the stock harness and the stock harness is only half plugged in. I think that was just starter because holding on the ECU and the starter, this one's just the ECU, so that's ACC. There, do you hear that? Yeah. Heck yeah. That's turning on the fuel pumps. I have the core of the car turning it on and just leaving the pumps on for now, but normally you know, you'll have them prime and all that. I'm just letting them just go. Keep it simple. Put these two in here, just accessories. It's gonna be three, and then four would be starter. Plug this in. Accessories are on. This is in lock, off. There you go. That's an exciting first step. The other major system that I wired to make sure it doesn't become a fire hazard is the AC system. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it to accessories. And it does turn on the AC system. Let's see if this... Oh my god. That's awesome. And what's really wild, watch this. I turn it on, the system turns on, the AC unit tells me, hey, I need to turn on the AC. This AC unit says, hey, it's time to turn on the clutch 
on the AC pump. So I start this up, it pauses for a second and then tells the command, hey, I'm ready now. And so you can actually see this whole system talking to each other. So we should be able to do defrost like this. There you go. The fan is very strong. At the very least, there's uh, air. Yeah, yeah, it's not it just stuffy in here. Time waits for no man. It is past midnight, it's almost one. And I need to get these ready to be mounted first thing in the morning. So how important this is, I'm gonna remove my billet engine piece that we're building. This is a little teaser, because we it haven't put any of yeah, this we out. We have not revealed this, aside from the coolant drying on it. We're still rotary guys at heart. Oh, that's beautiful. This is my first moment holding this thing. This is the second time we've machined 15 inch weld wheels and it's only because we were tinkering. I had to improvise a little bit. These fit perfectly wedged here. I just have to watch out for the edge of this thing. I'm trying to get it as square as possible. Two bolts straight through here. She's not going anywhere. This is that moment that I'll replay in the video before I trash my beautiful, perfect wheels. We're gonna go ahead and do one of five. Let's see what happens. Stop. I caught it. Oh. It's okay. The, the tool holder handles that. Okay, round two. looks incredible for that vibration. That finish turned out pretty damn good. Could be way better. Still kept the lip. Everything else looks absolutely perfect. Pop off the next couple ones. Get this thing cut quick. We are delirious. The only one that's not a voice of reason. <laughs> Erica's here. This is Tuesday, the day that we pick up the trailer. We're trying to leave tonight. The CNC machine messed up due to the heat. The probe didn't know that you're supposed to calibrate it every six months and the heat caused the probe to be off by 30 thousandths. And so all of our lug nut holes are off, but thankfully, because they're concentric, they're conical that we switched to, it centers itself. So the only thing we have now is there's a visual issue that's just slightly off. It's coming together insanely quick. Yep. Yeah. Reverse. So that's reverse. Left. Right. And stop. Nice. Okay, that's good. Uh, we got it working. Got it connected in. Ethan bent that plate for me so that we can run the, the engine harness into the cabin instead of having all this shit in the outside area. This is like us seeing uh, the bride for the first time. We get to see the wheels mounted to the rims, to the wheels, to the tires, all in one spot. I'm excited because that was a little bit of weirdness on our end getting the CNC stuff. Let's see. That is... Oh, yes. Just wants to tip over. Yeah, that's the lack of radials. Bias pies exaggerate the whole like you're not on the full tire right now with too much pressure, too little pressure, and it does the exact opposite to cups. This combination is just ridiculous. Looking good. Yeah. Jeez. That is fatty. Good lord. That's nuts. You picked the perfect wheel. It just fits the car perfectly. Let's do the fronts, because they're matching. Fronts are, are definitely heavier than the rear. That's classic meaty mean. That is raw muscle car. You know why we're able to build all the way to the last day and then turn around and actually put down decent times if it's not for my driving ability improving? It's because we can trust in companies like Valvoline, particularly Valvoline. I know that my engine is just taken care of. And so what we're gonna do here is a little fancy something. This is not a Valvoline specific thing. So we're gonna use 040, which is what is recommended for this engine. But two things are occurring. One is that this has considerably more power than stock. And two, we don't have a fan on the oil cooler system. So if we wanna go back to back to back, I want that slightly thicker oil. Of course, it puts VR1, it puts my baby into this motor. You've got more of the ZDDP. We'll have a nice little combination of both and I can push this engine even harder. 
this is what I run in the C8 Corvette. I run what I run because I know the science behind what I run. It's not just the certification. When you're looking at oil, if you're going to be around OEM and you're asking, hey, what's the best oil? The oil that you get off the shelf, like Valvoline's full synthetic, is spoiling the car already. Advanced, full synthetic, they're all you know above and beyond in so many different ways. But when you start modifying your car, especially when it comes to heat, you're going to be making the oil system work harder. So there'd be foaming issues, there could be more than anything, heat issues. I've seen how hot Valvoline's oil can run on the rotaries, because the rotaries use it as a major part of their engine cooling. When you do that, you start to see oil degradation about 300 degrees. That has nothing to do with Valvoline, that's just a general rule of thumb. Well, Valvoline, you can take it so much further than you could to oils in the past. You'll even see race cars shut off more of their oil cooling, getting better aero, because they know that they can run the oil hotter. So that's why the 2050 comes into play. I want to warm it up quickly and then use all this power that we're working so hard to make. I obviously live and breathe this product. They're passionate about it. They're geeks. I'm a geek. They're engineers. I'm not an engineer. Just the science behind VR1 is just incredible. I was at a shoot for Top Gear and somebody was not using VR1. Not a big deal. All oils work well, but they had the exact same system as I did for the four rotor and their oil was foaming. And they're like, man, what do you have for the separator? I'm like, I don't run a separator. VR1 doesn't foam like that at all. And like, nobody talks about that. Oil isn't so much good or bad. Hey, this system, does this oil work better? Well, in that sense, this works better for just about every system. We're just gonna put like half a quart, maybe a quart. This is for good luck. A couple things I want you to sound off in the comments. Valvoline is considering making a 040 or otherwise mid-range between 530 and 2050 type of VR1. Would you buy it? I know the answer is yes, but I want Valvoline's team to see that because that's what helps them make decisions on new products. All of Valvoline's products are synergistic, meaning that they all can work together. It's not like you put this in there and it makes the other stuff curl or something like that. With the 040, and the benefits of the 2050, I think we are ready to see if my wiring is correct and just engage the starter. This monster right here, see this? Boop. Boop means beep, which means it can auto. Which means bop. bop. One of my favorite things about the Hoonicorn is that like you clink like when it comes online. Well and the oil fell out, so that's it. That is just incredible. I have failed Erica in the sense that she doesn't get to hear the car start up. Aww. We've got massive plans over the next couple days. We've got a flight soon, so I gotta head out. Just being so appreciative for this team. Everybody's keeping such a positive attitude. It's like 130 degrees in the shop every day, sweating through it, all the setbacks. And I'm so grateful for everything that you guys have been doing the whole time yeah. to help me out. As is already, it's just so mind-blowing and I can't even imagine what it's all gonna look like. We don't have experience with any of this. We're willing to roll up our sleeves and do it. And that fact that we're this close to bringing a running car in three weeks that has those on it says a lot about the team and the people that are involved and the companies that have been helping us. Very thankful for that. But we've got a wild night ahead of us because I forgot to get the trailer. So I gotta get it first thing <laughs> in the next couple hours. He did book it this time. I did book it. He just forgot to oh, pick it up. Forgot to pick it up. put O2 sensors in it, put it back up, and then make a little thing for it to hang off the exhaust. We're gonna put some gas into the car, turn the fuel pumps on, see if the fuel pumps will cycle and show fuel pressure. It might actually literally start. I have everything connected in.
That was a lot of feels. I was like, what the fuck did I forget? Yeah. Okay. Okay, it sees 47 PSI fuel pressure. I say we try and start it. What the heck? Fuck yeah, fuck yeah. This is a moment I got to share with Erica. I went and put the other wheels on, and this is the first time the car is sitting on its own weight on all four wheels of the new suspension. It's, oh wow, I, yeah, I, I didn't even know that. I got him right as soon as he got to the shop. moment I have been dreaming of. We got tons to do. It's going on its maiden journey. First drive and it's in the rain. It looks like the pressure was put into the wrong side of the power steering pump, I think. Now with the power steering helping instead of taking, I think this might be the main voyage. The clutch is amazing. That sounds nuts. I'll give it a little bit of a rev. That's freaking sick. Okay. You can hear the wine for sure. Really? I can't hear it from here. Oh my god. That's nasty. I did a lot of wiring, but I didn't do tuning. It did the thing. It felt. The, I felt a little bit of the thing. Huge shout out to X Clutch because I have no brakes and the e-brake didn't work. So I was using first gear to slow me back down. <laughs> I did that knowing I had no brakes. I was like, we'll figure it out. We got the hood on and Ethan's gonna find out if it fits right now. Yeah, it might. It looks like it's very close. But... No, I don't think we're gonna have to cut a hole in it. Yeah, there's room. 